Welcome back to another episode of The Loco Fit Show, where we redefine what healthy means to you. I'm your host, Lauren Codlin. This week, I'm joined by Rick, our team mental health counselor, to talk about nonverbal cues and their importance and understanding them. And this is something that I actually heard on a podcast recently with Robert Green, and he was discussing this just kind of in a larger picture with you know, how we evolved and like now with technology and just so many things like behind a screen and not in person, how we're really lacking these skills and how that is affecting us in this really negative way. I was like, oh my gosh, we have to do an entire podcast on this because it's something that we talk about a lot because we love in-person things, which is why we literally make the time to do this. We could easily do this over Zoom, right? Mm-hmm. Because it would be much easier on our schedules. But we prefer, like even this, is like prefer to do this in person. Like when you see clients, of course, you have to see a lot of them on Zoom, but would you say you prefer in person for Absolutely. most people? Because of these things, right? And how much richer is an experience in person versus like FaceTime or something, mm-hmm. or Zoom, which sometimes that's what you have to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have long distance relationships, long distance friends, um, everybody's busy, like totally get it. And that's better than not, right? Mm-hmm. Like seeing someone's facial expressions on FaceTime or Zoom is exponentially better than just hearing their voice. Mm-hmm. But then, and which is better than just reading like a text or some kind of message, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, if you listen to someone long enough, you can literally read stuff, of course, like in there, like there are certain like things that I read and I'm like reading it in the voice or like in like the annotation that someone might have. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing someone is always better, but being in person, these mm-hmm. nonverbal cues that we exhibit are so important for just like our, you know, appreciation or our understanding or just how we feel around someone, um, positively or negatively, mm-hmm. right? Like I think there's so much disconnect there. So I wanted to do a whole podcast on this and first wanted to start with eye contact because mm-hmm. I feel like this is probably one of the main things that people are, I don't want to say lacking now, but maybe it is lacking. Yeah. Definitely lacking that because of the, um, like you can see someone's eye contact through a screen, but like there's a huge difference like in person. Mm-hmm. Um, but would you say that there is just a difference now with people's eye contact like in general? Yeah, I think, you know, there's definitely been an impact that technology has made on our ability to communicate. Um, and in all the ways that it's improved communication, like, you know, you can, you can see a client, you know, from Tampa in Jacksonville or Miami and, you know, you can... It, For Australia, so, I mean, like, literally, it's right. like across the world. It's, it's global. So, like, technology's been great in terms of connecting you with people that you normally wouldn't have been able to connect with or interact with. But what it's done is it's kind of like, it's because it's been this avenue that has drawn all of our attention and our focus into it, we've stopped using some of the other skills that we're used to using. So when we talk about eye contact, it becomes, um, it's an unfamiliar practice for a lot of people. And in fact, many people avoid eye contact because they're so used to communicating everything through text, phone call, or through emails, right? That the art of like making eye contact with somebody makes them almost, a lot of people feel vulnerable and they feel uncomfortable with it. And it creates a level of anxiety in certain people. And it's just, and why is that? Because it is like, eye contact is the one way that you can establish a true connection. People will tell you that the eyes are the pathway to the soul, right? And so if I feel, if I don't practice that, if it's not a part of my everyday routine, and it's weird to say I have to practice that because before it was like everything we did was in person no matter what you were doing. Business meetings were in person. Like you had to fly to clients to see them in person. You know, you would occasionally talk on the phone with them, but business interactions were done in person. Family life was done in person. All these things happened in person. So eye contact was a part of our everyday life. And now that's like the minority of our interactions are in person. Most of the things that we do connect through the phone, through computer. And so we're not used to, we're used to having this buffer between you and I, a screen to kind of look through. And so it's not as vulnerable. Talking to somebody online is not as vulnerable as being in person and seeing them and being in their presence and sitting in front of somebody the way that you and I are. And when people talk about there's a lack of intimacy, there's a lack of connection, there's a lack of vulnerability, I think this is directly related to that. You know, the ability to sit down and look somebody in the eye and have a conversation, you don't need to touch them, but the ability to have this space is really important in terms of creating a connection with a person. 
Oh, can you do it without it? Of course you can. But it's just like people, their eye contact seems to be less and less. Um, it's become unfamiliar to them. You know, the way people meet each other now, by and large, is through the phone. It's through some sort of app or technology, you know? And so it's like the idea of making contact with somebody and feeling confident in, in keeping eye contact is kind of being lost on people because it's very vulnerable space. And without a buffer, that screen in front of you, you know, they, they just don't, it's not something that's really familiar to them. It's really crazy. Like, I don't know if you've experienced this at, I'm just thinking of a time I was at Starbucks and there was a, an issue with my nitro. And I was like, hey, like, I'm just, if you anybody who drinks nitro a lot knows that there is like the nitrogen in the coffee. Mm -hmm. So it like separates and, and all that. There's like a little bit of the foam at the top. And I get this entirely too much. Like I know that I can pick it up and know the weight that like this is the correct amount or this is too much foam and it happens like it's a machine like i get it i'm not upset but i'm not paying six dollars for half a cup of coffee mm -hmm. i'm just not and i'm not confrontational about a lot of things but i am about that so anyways mm -hmm. i was like remembering this one time i was like just super like hey like you know i think something you know it's just not right and i was explaining to, and the girl literally not even making eye contact with me not even looking at me and she's like yeah well that's like basically like saying like I'm stupid, like that's how we make the coffee. And I'm like, oh, I understand. I get this all the time. <laughs> this is not the problem. Um, I know there's something wrong with the machine, yada yada, whatever. But like our entire interaction, multiple interactions, never once looked at me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how are you actually having a conversation with me? Like I'm not upset. I'm just being like, hey, I just want a little more coffee. Like, that's literally it. Like I just mm -hmm. don't want half foam. And I just remember this. It was so uncomfortable because it was already an uncomfortable situation. Like I don't want to be that person asking for that, but already just like, her literally not engaging at all the mm -hmm. entire time. I was like, is this how you go about the day? Like, I felt like sad, you know? I was like, you literally are working in like a forward people facing job. Well, and this is the part when it comes to eye contact. What is your eye contact? What's the message? If we're talking about nonverbal cues, what we're actually saying is, what's the message that our nonverbal language is communicating? So what is your eye contact actually saying? And there's it can be taken in a lot of different contexts. It's like in a confrontation, eye contact can be seen as a way to kind of dominate or be aggressive, right? Think about it like this. How long you maintain eye contact says a lot about you, right? If you walk into the gym and you see somebody and you make eye contact with them, how long is an appropriate amount of eye contact before that becomes creepy? How short of an eye contact span does it become where you demonstrate some level of passivity? Right? I look at you, I make a quick glance, it's less than a second, and I look down. Right? What's the message that I'm sending you? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm shy, I'm not interested. If I make eye contact with you and I hold it for like more than three seconds, like let's let's do this now, and it seems intimidating a little bit. It's like go. That's only three seconds. <laughs> but there's something awkward about that, it's isn't there? Right <laughs> like there's it's Maybe like start fighting. <laughs> so it's Understanding that what you're saying with your eyes is an important message and the lack of ability to express ourselves, it says either the person can't receive the message the right way or we're not sending it the right way and that, that's, it's, it's a lost art of communication. There's a, like, do you remember the movie American Psycho? Mm -hmm. Okay. So great. Do you know Christian um, Bale based his character off of an interview that he saw with Tom Cruise? And one of the things he said was, he's like, I loved Tom Cruise's energy, and he said there was nothing behind his eyes. And that was the template for the character that he got because he felt like he was like he was void of emotion, right? And so it was like, that's what he picked up from the interview was just his energy level, and there was nothing behind his eyes. Hmm. There's another great movie, um, it's called the movie He's Just Not That Into You. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a scene where one of the characters, Kevin O'Connell, is talking to these two gay guys in like an open house. And the two gay guys are telling them like their cues for nonverbal communication and the, and the two gay guys are like, look, if you make eye contact for, if you hold eye contact for like two or three seconds or less than two or three seconds, it means nope, not interested. And they're like, here, watch. And they kind of look at each other like one, two, and they look away, nope, not interested. He's like, one, two, it's on, you know? and. <laughs> And so it's like, these are good examples of what eye contact and what our eyes send as a signal to other people and how they receive it. Tom Cruise probably thought he was being like fun and engaging, 
But the way Christian Bale interpreted his his demeanor and the message that his eyes sent were like, he's not there. He's this is all an act. And that's exactly what you know serial killers do. If you look at that movie, he was playing a serial killer, so he had to nail that role. That was right. Such a good role. But I think that's the part with eye contact is we're losing the ability to send and receive important messages that we don't get through the screens. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it can also just be like like a look of just like, hey, like understanding, mm -hmm. and like I'm here for you. And then somebody will be like, why are you staring? It's like, I'm not staring, I'm just like here. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just being receptive and open to like whatever you need, or maybe I'm thinking, or maybe whatever. Exactly. Um, I don't need to look away, I could just be like, I'm just here in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, of course, like the obvious, like loving expressions, or just like anger, like you can see that in someone's eyes. Um, and it's if you're really perceptive to it, you can notice those shifts, especially if you know the person, like if it's like a you know a friend or a partner, you'll be able to sense like, okay, with this look, like they might not even maybe recognize it at that point, but like when they're looking at me like this, I know this is mm -hmm. how they're feeling when they're looking at me like this. Mm -hmm. Something is maybe going in right. a different direction. Um, and it's it's really subtle, and I think that it's so important to be able to pick up on those cues because not in an accusatory way. Mm -hmm. Right, but just in a way of like, all right, maybe, like, how how can I either de-escalate the situation, or maybe I need to be more supportive here, mm -hmm. or maybe I just need to like receive whatever this person is giving me, and like that's great too. So I think it's really important for people to start to pick up on this, especially like the eye contact one is yeah. is is massive. Your eyes convey emotion. They convey yes. sadness, happiness, surprise, shock, sadness, mm -hmm. you know, depression. So you're missing the ability to connect through those that medium if you don't have and, and, and don't feel comfortable with eye contact. Like you're missing this whole dynamic of connecting and communicating if eye contact isn't there because you don't know what the person's feeling or expressing. Mm -hmm. And they don't know what you're feeling and expressing if they can't make eye contact with you. And I would say this is something that it's a skill like anything mm -hmm. else. So if you feel like you're listening to this and you're like, maybe I'm, I don't I don't know how much I do this or how comfortable or uncomfortable I am with this. Just start incorporating it more with you know, you can do it with strangers, like at the grocery store when you're checking out, like you don't need to be on your phone, you don't need to be, I mean, again, I get it, sometimes we're in the middle of everything, but like mm -hmm. small interactions like that, like, hey, you're checking out, oh, you know, they're usually nice, like, hey, did you find everything? Yeah, I did, thanks so much, like just make eye contact, like smile, mm -hmm. have a nice day, like little interactions like that are ways that you can start that don't really feel weird because mm -hmm. they're, like you're already there, <laughs> it's like literally gonna be 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and those are easy ways, like, yeah, going to get coffee, like going to do whatever. Um, you know, you're walking into a building, you hold the door for someone, you smile, oh, thanks, or you nod, even at the gym, right? Like, the smile and nod kind of a thing, like, you don't need to be, like, over or under doing it, right? Mm -hmm. But just like, oh, hi. Um, and those are just easy ways if you want to try it in, like, a kind of a non-threatening way, mm -hmm. right? Because if you feel uncomfortable and it's someone that you're going to be close with, you'd be like, oh, this is awkward, <laughs> you know, so you could do it with people that you don't really know, um, but in, like, short interactions. So that would be number one. Um, what is like something else we talked about earlier was like posture, mm -hmm. right? And this is a really interesting one. Um, and maybe not even just like, oh, do you have good posture or bad posture, but more so like probably postural changes, mm -hmm. right? Like, of course, someone could just like be slouching, but they maybe just slouch all the time. <laughs> it doesn't mean they have bad body language, but postural changes, like what do you see there um, or notice, I guess? Well, with me, postural changes, you know, represent to me a person's level, like that, it's, what they're communicating to you is whether or not they feel comfortable and whether or not they might feel anxious or stressed in those moments, right? You know, if somebody's, there's certain things that we can interpret and we can try to interpret about somebody's body language, right? Like if a person's like, you know, leaned back, you know, just like this, it's like, well, what is their body posture actually saying? Are they saying that they're um, totally relaxed? Or are they sending a message that they don't care about the conversation, like that they're not engaged? When we talk about having somebody's attention, do I want to be facing away from you or facing toward you, mm -hmm. right? And so this is like I'm, I'm locked into this conversation. But if my shoulders turn and I'm like talking to you out of the side of my face, right, where I have to turn my head in order to kind of see you, it does send other messages where it's like I'm either not as connected to this conversation um, I'm not as involved. And when you see somebody's posture change, oftentimes it's not necessarily like, might not necessarily be something that you need to interpret other than they might not feel comfortable or they might not feel, or they might be feeling anxiety in that particular moment. And so that's where I look at more or less posture changes. Um, 
you know, somebody shifting in their chair a lot, right? You know, their, their leg starts bouncing. It's like, these aren't necessarily indicators of like, you know, deception or anything like that, but this is just like, they're telling you, oh, maybe we're getting to a space that's making me uncomfortable. I'm starting to feel anxious or nervous. And you want to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. And is that something that you, like say you're talking to a client, right? Is that something that you might like bring up or you just kind of like let that play out and then see how they respond? Because there is a thing, like there is something to be said about if you bring that up, right? That mm -hmm. can be useful. Like, hey, I noticed that maybe this has changed, mm -hmm. like as the conversation has gone on. But that could also derail someone potentially, right? If it comes mm -hmm. from like a threatening way, because then they could be like, oh, did you notice that? Or, oh my gosh, now, now I'm overthinking this. So where is like, and of course it's going to be case by case basis, mm -hmm. of course. Um, but what is, I guess, a way if, so say you have noticed someone is changing, right? Like maybe they were making eye contact and they were really comfortable and they were kind of just sitting here moving a little bit. Because some people, like I'm someone who moves a lot, like doesn't mm -hmm. mean I'm uncomfortable, but I kind of just move around a lot. But I'm making eye contact and then all of a sudden, like something has changed, maybe you asked a question, and I'm now I'm, I'm changed my tone, right? And maybe my leg starts to like really kind of shake, and mm -hmm. then I'm kind of like darting, I'm not really looking at you, and then I, like right. So, at what point would you say something, and that would allow someone to feel open still, and maybe not shut down mm -hmm. from that? Because I think a big part of nonverbal cues, especially if you are someone who can notice that, is also like not holding that over someone, right? Like, oh, I noticed that you made this change. Mm -hmm. How's everything going over there? You're like, well, whoa. <laughs> Sometimes I won't call out the specific behavior that I see as much as I will try and label it for them. Mm. Like if it's a new person and they're sitting in front of me and I notice that their leg is shaking and I notice that they're shifting in their chair, they're ne not necessarily making eye contact. I might say something like, therapy can be really vulnerable and you, it doesn't seem like you're really comfortable right now, you know, that there might be some anxiety. And a lot of times the person is like, yes, or you know what, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not comfortable right now. It's like, okay, I don't need to be like, I see your leg bouncing and I do this. You know, other times though, you can use it as a way to kind of call out the inconsistency between what a person is verbally saying versus what their body is saying. And I might say, you know, I might call them out on that. Like, you know, you're telling me that everything is okay, but I've seen you, you know, you're shifting in your chair, your leg is bouncing, at, you know, a thousand miles a minute, but you're, you're verbally saying everything is all right. It seems like a mixed message to me, you know, like, tell me why your leg is bouncing. Now, sometimes people can just be like, you know, I had a lot of caffeine and it's like, okay, don't read into it. Maybe they're just, they're bouncy and full of energy. You know, I think sometimes people are always looking for like, like there's like this secret code to really understanding some of that stuff. And sometimes it's just anxiety. Mm -hmm. Other times it's like, so there's a time and a place to do it, but what I don't want to do is call it out in such a way that can be too aggressive where it shuts the person down and now they're not thinking about, you know, their emotions and they're just focusing on their body trying to remain still and now they're no longer present in the moment, mm -hmm. right? It's like, well, that, that defeated the point. Yeah. And it might be something too, like this goes for all relationships, like you have to learn someone's baseline, right? So if after a few sessions you notice that the person mm -hmm. is someone who just moves a lot, you maybe aren't going to say like, oh, this is necessarily a bad thing right or right. Not, this isn't a change from like their baseline um like i know for me i i I'm, i move a lot like so i'm someone who like even if i'm not anxious like i'm i'm doing that i, I typically will do other behaviors like i'll find something if i'm like really mm -hmm. anxious and then i'll kind of like fiddle with it but one thing that i do that's so frustrating you probably know this a lot is when i'm thinking I will not be able to make eye contact because I'm like, I am actually have to like look away mm -hmm. when I'm like processing something. If someone like asks me a question where I'm like really trying to think about something, I almost have to like either close my eyes or like look away so that I can like process it somewhere else and then like come back. And I'm like, well, it's not that I'm uncomfortable making eye contact. It's like literally though how I like think is I will like, I can't be here. I need to be like in this other plane of dimension. <laughs> And then I come back um, and I don't know what that is like it, it's not me like I don't people to think and sometimes I'll say it I'm like I'm not not looking like I'm not trying to break eye contact I'm just trying to answer your question mm -hmm. um, you know whatever because I, I have no problem in, with those interactions mm -hmm. like do people do other people do this like sure I'm like what is like mm -hmm. I don't know what this is um, but I find that it like that's how I can like process stuff and then I like go back with like an answer yeah, and I think that's an important part that you just brought up. Like, once you understand and have a rapport with somebody, and this doesn't just have to be with like a, a client, this can be with anybody that you know. And who that person is in different settings can play, they can have different roles. Like, here's a perfect example. 
you and I are, you know, we're in the safe confines of your office. And like when I'm talking one on one with people, I have absolutely no problem maintaining eye contact. But for those of you that don't know, like Lauren and I have known each other for years and we used to train Jiu Jitsu together. And it was fairly common for people to like, you know, hang out after class or go out into a parking lot or something. But once I go into a public environment, I was in the prison system for a lot of years. And one of the things that you don't do is you don't, yeah, I was working there, sorry. I wasn't an inmate. (laughs) Um, You learn very quickly to scan your environment constantly because you don't know, and it wasn't necessarily an attack on me, but you don't know what was happening in that environment. And fights and and things would pop off all the time. And so you learn to keep your back to a wall. You learn to constantly scan. Mm -hmm. And I've been, you know, in situations where people are like, you know, they look at that behavior and they're like, "He, he can't focus. He's not paying attention to me. He's looking around the room, you know, and it's like, well, give me in a one-on-one environment and I'm a completely different person. You put me in a public environment where I don't know what's happening. You know, there's a bar in the corner, there's people screaming through the parking lot. You know, you're like, I'm less focused on the conversation and more scanning the room for safety. And so, but that lack of eye contact indicates like my stress level is a little bit higher now. When I can make more eye contact, I'm more relaxed, I'm calm, and I don't feel like the environment is as much of a stressor. So those things can change depending on the environment that you put people in. And I think that's an important context to look at. If people are like, well, they're not paying attention to me, what's the environment look like as well? Is it overstimulated? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you need to have situational awareness right now? Like, Are you in a place where you don't know what's going on? That's totally acceptable. Or are you at your house on the couch and you're trying to talk to your significant other and they're on their phone? Yeah, they're not paying attention, right? right? Like, or, or, you know, hey, maybe you're the one who's now breaking a boundary because they maybe were like, hey, I need to finish this. Um, give me 20 minutes and then we'll get back, like, right? We'll get back to this conversation. And then sometimes the other person can be like, well, it, and it's like, well, yeah, they're not going to pay attention because mm-hmm. they said that they weren't going to for the next however many minutes, right? Mm-hmm. So there's always like a give and take there, but eye contact, posture, facial expressions, mm-hmm. which is part of eye contact. Facial expressions say everything without actually verbalizing anything. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the things that, you know, as kids, we grow up and we don't know how to interpret facial expressions. Like if you were to show a two-year-old expressions of a person's face, they're cognitively not going to be like, this is sad, this is angry necessarily. But throughout our life, we learn those things. Like you learn when your parents are upset, you know, by the pursing of the lips or the clenching of a fist. Um, Obviously we're talking about facial expressions, but like if your lips go up or down, like if they're flat, you know, the expressions that your eyes make, right? We can tell whether or not a smile is genuine or fake based by the crow's feet on somebody's eyes, right? Like if it's a fake smile, there's no wrinkles. If it's a genuine smile, there's those little crow's feet. So, you know, we used to do, when I worked in the prison system, I used to have like various, like uh, pictures of different faces. And we used to hold them up and I used to give them a piece of paper and I'd be like, I want you to write down what this face tells you. And it's amazing how difficult that is sometimes and how accurate it is at others. Mm-hmm. And so it gives you a little bit more insight into that person's particular pathology, right? I was going to say, was that like probably a little bit um, abnormal? Just given some the population? Of them, yeah, right? some of it can't be like, you know, if you were to administer the test to, to most people, they're like, okay, this is happiness, this is sadness, this is shock. This is fear. This is anger, and they and they get along with it. Sometimes when somebody would interpret, and again, you use it loosely, like this isn't like a hard and fast rule. But when somebody was smiling, you know, and they would be like danger, and it's like, tell me about what danger was. Well, my dad used to smile right before he hit me. Mm. It's like, gotcha, right? And sometimes they have a difficult time with expressing or understanding what real emotional connectivity would looks like and this is just a lack of people teaching them empathy and but they're really good at being able to read certain facial configurations like they're really good at identifying anger they're really good at understanding situations where people are afraid because they can pick up on those emotions because those are the ones that were most comfortable for them but facial expressions say everything and we have to be mindful of that like you know the widening of your eyes like what does that indicate like shock and awe you know, if we immediately like look down, but our eyes get wide, like we can tell somebody like you're stupid with our look. We can tell somebody that we're really surprised. 
we can smile at that person and let them know that like, hey, I'm friendly and what does that say and how does that communicate? What are you saying to people with your eyes, with your face? How does that communicate a message? And again, we're, we're, we're seeing this less and less because people are relying on you know, more and more technology. We communicate through email, there's no face there, there's maybe a picture. You know, if you're on dating apps or anything like that, you're seeing a picture of a person and you're communicating via text. So you can't see tone, you can't see their facial expressions, you know, a ha 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 or a smiley face. How hard are they actually laughing? You know what I mean? If somebody typed ha 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 like that, come on, cross Um, <laughs> please never type ha ha ha. I didn't say ha period, ha period, ha period. I said ha ha ha, like no spaces. <laughs> Suddenly there's a difference, right? There's definitely a difference. <laughs> if someone typed that, I'd be like, whoa. Um, but yeah, it's so crazy to think, like once you have, and I think I said this kind of in the beginning, like once you have someone's, like once you've been around someone for a long time, mm -hmm. like I can read, if, if you send me a text, I'm reading it in your mm -hmm. probably tone, mm -hmm. right? For the most part, um, you know, an email, whatever. And same thing goes like if I've worked with clients for a long time, like I know, and that's that's part of like, you know, learning your clients is mm -hmm. I'm reading a lot from them and I can pick up very minor changes based on, you know, their tone or their mm -hmm. perceived tone the way that they're writing things, the way they're explaining or not explaining something, right? Like if there's any kind of change from their baseline, I can pick up because after several weeks of working with someone, I kind of have an idea of where they're, how they're gonna respond, how they're gonna say things. Um, so any change from that is a change that I need to take note of. So there's many people who like, I have built so much, like so much of a relationship and a connection with that like, I can still read stuff and like know when they're, in a good place, or it was a great week, or it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, but that takes time, and that also takes um, being really perceptive about it. And it really helps if you do have an in-person relationship with someone, or any kind of in-person interactions. And it's that's what makes these like digital things so hard. And I think there's also like that fallout kind of thing too, where it's like maybe you feel like you know someone, mm -hmm. and then you like meet, and then you're like, oh, what? You know, like this is not how I thought you were. Mm -hmm better or sometimes worse, right? Right. Sometimes it's like, whoa, like we have way more personality in person than like I thought. Because mm -hmm. um, like you can say like in social media, right? You can follow someone, you can see what they say, you can even watch their videos, like, you know, video, written word, whatever it might be. And then you meet someone in person and like maybe even like message with them, comment back and forth, and mm -hmm. you feel like you have this relationship. And then sometimes you meet people and you're like, this is like a totally different person yeah. in a not so great way, and then there's other times where you're like, wow, this is a totally different person in a way deeper and more nuanced, like mm -hmm. rich way. Um, and that's why I think it's one of the challenges of, of dating apps is because there's certain people who you might write off because of like that first, those first few interactions that like maybe if you'd met in person, it mm -hmm. would have been like, that would have been so much better. Whereas some people are really good with like how they write, mm -hmm. what they say, but then in person it's like, it kind of falls flat for your connection. So anyway, it's a whole different well, kind of tangent. But what you're talking about though is like, that's a non-verbal cue is the energy that a person brings. Mm -hmm. Like how enthusiastic are they? You know, what do you pick up from that person being in person with you versus them existing online? Mm -hmm. And I don't just, and forget the dating app part of it. This is relevant for, yeah, for everything. everything. And in particular now, social media. Mm -hmm. um, because if you think about like, like celebrities, you know, or at least you used to know, everything about a celebrity that they want to put out, that their publicist puts out through interviews. Those are small snippets of a person's actual life. And social media works the same way for us. It's kind of like, I don't need somebody else to interview me because I've got this platform now where I can start posting jokes and memes and I can send videos, but you're still only getting small little slivers of a person's personality. You might look at this person and go, okay, it's clear they have a great sense of humor or they like this kind of comedy or they like these things. And so you learn small aspects of them. But everything changes when you meet that person in person. You can pick up their energy, how connected to the moment they are, what their eye contact says, what their facial expressions say about who you are and, and their ability to relate and communicate with you. And more and more people communicate through other mediums other than in person. And so they don't know how to read these things. And it changes once they're in person. Mm -hmm. 
which is why I always see the value of meeting people, you know, especially somebody that you're going to consider a relationship with in person. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that you can, I think that technology is really great for maintaining relationships of all kinds, but there has to be that in-person component, mm -hmm. right? And even, you know, I'm so blessed that I have so many great friends now in my life, but the majority of them live in different cities. So we have to stay connected through like FaceTimes and Zooms and voice notes and little sure. stuff like that. But that also has to be coupled with, okay, do I get to see them? You know, even if it's just a few times a year, that's still like great, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But like our relationships are built off of those things and then they're just maintained through the, the technology. Yeah. Um, what about affirming like actions, right? Sure. What about like, like, oh, okay, yes, like a nod, and like, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. like those things, how, I guess, how can someone either pick up on those better, or like, what are some things to look for, what are some ways that they can improve that, potentially? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think being aware of it is like, okay, if I'm going into a conversation, I want to be aware of what my nonverbal communication is saying, and there's things that you can do, like, tell yourself, like, go through kind of a list of things, like, number one, face the person, number two, make solid eye contact throughout, but you know, if I feel like it's becoming too intense, it's okay to blink, it's okay to look away for a second and come back to the conversation. Um, uh, you know, what are my nonverbal cues indicating? Am I, if I agree with somebody, am I kind of nodding my head yes, you know? And there's, there's some people who, are, who talk about like kind of the mimicking and mirroring effect, right? Like if you want somebody to be in sync with you, you start to mimic their emotions, or not their emotions, but their body posture. Like you're sitting here with your feet crossed, so I'm gonna, sit with my foot crossed. I'm gonna take my right arm and put it, you know, mm. right down here and I'm gonna put my arm. And so now it's like we're in sync, right? We're, we're feeling the same thing. And so very it, people use this <laughs> stuff that way. Use it and so, you know, <laughs> they try to, like if there's, there's whole, you know, body posture kinds of things with this stuff. And so it's sub, it, what it's designed to do is subconsciously link the two of you together. Right, to be like, we're in sync, we agree, we do these things. And sometimes, you know, a head nod is a great way of letting somebody know that, like, I like what you're saying, I'm, I, I vibe with it, you know, but sometimes you can see this, like, and what are the, what are the worst ones is <laughs> some people will do this, they'll, they'll give you a nonverbal, and then they'll give you a verbal affirmation, they'll be like, yes, that's exactly right, and it's like, which one do I believe? You shaking your head no, or the verbal, and people lie more with their mouth, but not necessarily with their mm -hmm. their physical reaction. They aren't as aware of it. But I think kind of having that checklist of like these are things that I want to make sure I do when I meet somebody. I want to square my shoulders up to them and just be present in the conversation, not turned away, not angled away. I want to be engaged in it, and I want this person to know that they have my attention and that nothing else in the room is as important as them. Mm -hmm. I want to make solid eye contact. I want to speak with a clear tone, obviously, but this is nonverbal. So I want to smile. I want to be not like standoffish. And you can send different messages based off of what your lips tell you, what your eyes tell you, all those kinds of things. Think of it like this. What's a handshake indicate? Um, Anything you want it to, right? Like if I do this, right, and I'm... You know, it's kind of like, well, what does that indicate? You know, versus like, you know, where it's like a solid grip. Yeah. That's a nonverbal form of communication. Like, what does a hug indicate? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? You know, that ass out hug where you're like, I don't want to touch you. You know, but what, is it, what does a hug look like when you wrap both arms around the person and you make that kind of contact? Mm -hmm. What message are you indicating with that? You know, are you just giving them the side hug? Are you giving them a pat on the back? What's the high five indicate? You know, it's like, you know, where you touch a person matters. Like if I reach forward and I touch your hand or I touch your shoulder, where on your back I touch you indicates a lot of things, mm -hmm. right? Like inappropriate, appropriate. Like, you know, so there's, there's all these different kind of nonverbal cues that we use in communication and you want to be aware of them. You want to be aware of what you're doing and how you're doing it so that you can convey the right message. I think there's even <clears throat> something where um, I'm seeing the phone over there. I can't. Oh my gosh, I'm like, for, forgetting where I heard this or like what the context was, but something along the lines of like, if you were have your phone next to you and you're like in a conversation with someone, having it facing up or it facing down or it being not visible has like different internal reactions mm -hmm. for that person, right? Like for the other person. So say like your phone is like not visible, 
versus like it's over there like clearly like mm -hmm. it's there like you can get it but it's not your first priority versus if it's next to you and it's like lighting up and then you're like talking and then you're looking at it um of course like that creates mm -hmm. all these like that's not verbal you know that's like an action that you took mm -hmm. it's not obviously it's not on like your body and your person but like it was a deliberate action that you took that would make someone else feel different yeah. And I know I've, I've literally shared this study a hundred thousand times, but it's still like one, of my, like one of the most interesting studies because it combines so many different facets, but it was, they're looking at stress perception, like positive or negative, and the, the test subject was giving a um, verbal presentation, which of course any kind of public speaking makes most people super mm -hmm. nervous already. And then essentially there was a group of people that were either, like they're in the one group, they were like affirming, like, you know, mm -hmm. nod, kind of, like light smile, like not saying like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, great job, but just, you know, positive affirmations sure. um, in a nonverbal sense. And then there, the other group was giving the presentation and then they were doing like negative kind of affirmations, just like looking away, looking down, kind of like the, the no. And there was the one group um, secreted both cortisol and DHEA sulfate. So having the balance of like anabolic to catabolic hormones mm -hmm. and a, like a normal positive stress response versus um, the other group only had the cortisol secretion, um, which was more negative, negative, stress, negative response, stress response. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me that like, and of course that was one study, it's not saying, but think about the extrapolation of that across months mm -hmm. and years, right? If you are constantly, you know, around that or that's all that you're seeing, right? Like how is that going to affect you? Um, so it was, it's one of my favorite things to like cite just because it, it shows how powerful like small things like that in an already stressful situation the stress was still there the stress mm -hmm. is still happening you're talking in front of people like that's stressful but how did how is that mitigated mm -hmm. right um, so I just absolutely love the implications of that because yeah like there's so many times where we could give like a small like yeah good job or like even just like with our eyes mm -hmm. you know um, this is something actually on Zoom calls that is really stressful for me, at least in an in-person setting. Um, you can kind of pick up on it a little bit easier because you know that like, so say you're presenting to someone and there's 30 people in the room. You can kind of see like some people are going to kind of be like, there's going to be some people who are giving negative affirmations for sure. Mm -hmm. They're not really like vibe with your talk, which is fine. Other people are going to have, you know, positive affirmations and other people are going to be like taking notes, not distracted, but just like, you know, not maybe looking at you. And that's kind of like the mixed bag that you're going to get with Zoom. Like say you're doing like a lecture or a presentation or just like a call. People often just like kind of forget mm -hmm. that they're, that someone else is talking, you know? And even if like they love it, like they could just look like they're doing something else or look away or look distracted. Um, and I don't think that people really recognize that as much as like an in-person kind of thing, like when they're, when they're listening. Um, so whether that's like a presentation or a meeting or whatever it might be, but yeah, like the Zoom kind of creates this like false barrier mm -hmm. <laughs> um, where then people will just be like, mm -hmm. like, are, are you enjoying this? You know, mm -hmm. like, oh my God, that was such a great talk. And I'm like, really? Because it looked, it did look. Yeah. You know, so, but I think that people can sometimes forget just given the nature of the screen um, that is there that those things do matter. Because I feel like in person, people would not be doing that. But like, because of that, uh, they are. So, Completely, yeah. No, so no. interesting. The dynamic changes when you're in. Do you even notice that with, room. do you ever work with clients who do some Zoom and some in person? And do you notice a difference or not? Uh, the ones that do both um, are pretty engaged. Okay. Like, cause you, you know, and there's some people who I've never seen in person, but are very engaged in their sessions mm -hmm. and, and, and really active. Um, but you can always tell, like, you know, the person sitting in front of their computer or their phone, there's always distractions. You know, text messages come through, notifications come through. Somebody, you know, you can see, you're talking to somebody and you see this and you see them, like, look over because you don't have another monitor with their email or a chat popped up. And, you know, and so there's just, there's all these added distractions that pull away from it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a difference between when you're in person, right, your attention is here. And that's what I think the message is saying. Like, I don't care whether your phone is face up or face down, if it's on the table, you're sending me a message that says that phone is still more important than I am. However, if that phone is in your pocket or in a completely different room, you're telling me that I'm important to you, right? And that this conversation is important to you. And that's a nonverbal cue. Um, and there's a thousand of them that happen in every conversation. But, um, 
you know, that's just kind of starting to become aware of it and starting to practice. Like, what are my nonverbal cues indicating to people? You know, am I, am I nodding in agreement? Am I making good eye contact? Is my posture facing them? Like, is my facial expression warm and welcoming? Or are my lips pursed? You know, when somebody says something, do I have this eye roll? And what does my eye roll tell them? Right, Lauren? I would never do that. I would never roll my eyes. You just you've, did. You've never seen me. <laughs> So to close this out, let's talk about some of the just the kind of things that are false with body language because I know you wanted to touch on that and it's something I didn't even honestly think of. Um, but to go into some of the stuff that's kind of been debunked, and not saying that it's not important, mm -hmm. but in the sense of like maybe how serious it was taken. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I want people to know like this is always one of these things. There's no nonverbal gestures that indicate deception. Right, and so what does that mean? There's people who will tell you like these old kind of myths, like where they're like, a person's lying if they're telling you something and they scratch their chin. And I've heard that the higher up on the face you go, the more you're lying. Like so, if they're like scratching their forehead or touching their ear or rubbing their nose, that that's an indication of deception, like that they're lying. Um, it's crap. None of that. There's no. There's no way for somebody to look at a nonverbal cue and indicate a deception. What nonverbal cues can indicate is a person's level of anxiety increasing, the stress inside them increasing. And that could be a variety of factors. Either they're uncomfortable with the subject matter, or maybe they are lying and so they're starting to shift and move around. But there's no like, touching this or doing this indicates some level of deception. Um, you know, because there was like that show called like Lie to Me. I don't know if you remember that years ago. It was with Tim Roth. He was a nonverbal, he was like a lie detector. He was like a human lie detector. And based off of like nonverbal cues, he could determine whether or not somebody had, you know, was, was deceptive. Um, and there's certain things that you can use as indication, like proximity to which you'll stand to somebody can indicate whether or not you're intimate with them. Right, or have been intimate with them. Because somebody who you've been, and when I mean intimate, like a sexual relationship with, um, you tend to have different barriers and boundaries subconsciously with people who you've been intimate with versus people who you haven't been intimate with. Um, and so sometimes, like, you know, you can use small things to assess like that, but there's no indication of lies and deception. One of the other things that is always kind of interesting to me is people think that, like, when you're having a conversation with somebody and they like fold their arms across their chest, that we're always told that, you know, they're creating a barrier between, you know, you and them and that this is an indication of, you know, either distrust or anger or contempt. And it's like, actually, they're just giving themselves a hug. Like, this is comfortable. And so when you realize that, you're like, oh, like somebody folding their arms is not like, you know, you're hitting a sensitive area. <laughs> it's just comfortable to them. So. Stop reading into too much, you know, nonverbal communication. Like, is, sure. is that, and this is the part, like, is that what they're conveying or is that what you're interpreting? And awesome. there's, a, there's a message there, right? Which is why then verbal communication is super important. Yes. <laughs> because, and, and, the, and kind of how we said, sort of in the beginning, like in a disarming way, not in a way of like, oh, I noticed you shifted that. Like, how are you feeling? Are you really anxious now? Is this okay? Like, are you mad at me? Like, of course, there is a way that, like, that can be used against someone mm -hmm. in, in a not negative in a negative way that's only going to like potentially increase a behavior like that mm -hmm. um so don't want to look too much into it right because most people are just like shifting or they're looking away or they're whatever but it's like if it's a pattern right if you start to notice like there's a pattern or if you can just really you do see like something is is upsetting them like hey like what was that upsetting i know this is a hard conversation that we're having or whatever it might be and just being like accepting and open to that is super important but this is definitely I mean we have evolved over time to pick up on these cues because that is how we like survived for so many years that's mm -hmm. how we communicated for so many years so our bodies are hardwired for this however it is a skill I think that has been you know broken mm -hmm. to some degree with how much technology that we use in our everyday life and just how isolated we are in our everyday life so while this is how we are hardwired I think it is something that at this point, for many people, they have to put into practice yeah. as a skill. It has to become a conscious decision to be aware of some of these things, especially if you're, because there's all these remote jobs now where you don't have to interact with people and everything is done through the computer. And so people become very isolated. They, they become very disconnected. And it's, this isn't, 
you know, I mean, even, even what you wear sends messages to people. The clothes that you choose send messages. And, you know, most people don't have to get out of their pajamas anymore to do their job. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're seeing this kind of cultural shift in what nonverbal communication actually looks like and how do we use it and what is, you know, and how to be comfortable with it when, it, uh, when we need to use it. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is super fascinating to me and, and really, really important. So hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions for Rick or you're interested in contacting him for his services, what is your email? Uh, FullCircleTherapyFL at gmail.com. And if you guys have any other questions for us, I really do want to make it a priority to make the podcast more engaging with questions from you guys and different prompts. So we will drop the link below. It is anonymous. You can submit as much or as little detail as you feel comfortable with for any questions or situations that you guys might have and you would like us to answer. And for all other inquiries about coaching or consulting, you can visit teamlogofit.com. So thank you guys so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.